Good morrow, fellow humans. My name is Sean Crowley, and I am obsessed with infinity. So join me as I attempt to unpick the infinities of what is. So you've taken a moment for yourself, a pause in the crazy. Well, firstly, let me just say kudos on your escape. So how long do we have together? A few sentences? A few minutes, maybe? I guess since time is of the essence, it's best we not waste it with pleasantries. So let me instead start by saying this. There is infinity within every finite measure. For this is a cosmos that denies all prophecy of hierarchy. A unified embrace of all that ever was, is, shall or shan't be. Omitting not even the categorical antithesis that is infinite nothing herself. It is a wholeness whose infinite is of a qualitative oneness. And this, this is what we are. Right. So, how many are still with me? I'm sure that's put a few listeners off. It's always fun to see how people react to that sort of waffle. How they instantaneously deflect and scatter, regroup upon yet another declaration of opinion. But what about you? How did you react? Perhaps the nerve struck resulted in an instinctive pose of defence, leaving you now standing at the ready with tripped bullshit alarm. Or maybe even flushed with the intent of a hearty righteous debate. Or perhaps your defensive pose just resulted from the nonplussed assumption that we're merely dealing with the rehashing of old news, uh, preaching to the choir, as it were. Or did you fall into that other camp where the only reaction was a happy twinge of curiosity? It's a healthy response, though one more often followed by a relatively quick retake on the still unresolved matter as to whether I might ever be able to justify such a madcap opening ramble. Regardless, no matter who you are or how you prefer your waffle, I now welcome you wholeheartedly to this our now shared pause in the crazy. To the doubters, sideliners, converted, Curious and preachers alike, I humbly invite you all. Though I should point out that with this invitation, I don't intend on offering my listeners the usual pleasant or passive page turner, if even I could. Because for the most part, what I intend to discuss is you, and all that it means to be you. And so for that reason, I sincerely encourage you to join the conversation to consider your own mind, to both contemplate and challenge the numerous concepts that we will come across as together we muddle our way through the many great timeless puzzles that this audacious universe has had the gall to throw at us during our own short stints upon this beautifully insignificant planet. It will be a discussion intended to take us as far down the rabbit hole as we can possibly go past the pinnacles of hard-sought knowledge, towards the outermost limits of language itself, where upon some distant plateau shall we aim to finally sit, dangle our feet over the edge and just begin wondering at the hesitant shadows that lay cast amid the slowly parting mists of our understanding. And it shall be here, upon these misty shorelines, where you and I will be encouraged to challenge our own philosophies, Not for the purpose of tearing them down, but for the purpose of allowing them to grow. Since it's only through the practice of stepping back and re-examining our own positions that we can ever hope to uncover the invisible dangers which, when left unchallenged, can leave us feeling lost, alone and separated from so much of the world that surrounds us. (sighs) 
I'm sure there are many who, in this age of tech and instant communication, will consider the philosopher a somewhat outdated occupation. As Stephen Hawking so bluntly put it, philosophy is dead. Because in contrast to the exciting, profitable and world-changing influence of science, philosophy can more often be pigeonholed as a more or less frivolous pursuit. Reserved for the languishing student still seeking their way in a wider world, or for the self-important podcaster forever screaming into the wind, these being some of my favourite people. Though what this is failing to appreciate is that, as our scientific fields have been expanding, exponentially opening doors in our collective understanding, the global community of philosophers have hardly found themselves relegated to the pages of history. On the contrary, because due to this accelerated progress, philosophers have, if anything, only had their responsibilities compounded. But as it has been with so many fields of expertise, has the breadth of knowledge become so fantastically vast? Have the once broad pools of inquiry inevitably required some element of compartmentalization, which in most cases has led to the replacement of the traditional philosopher as to the traditional scientist, with the ever-diversifying role of the modern-day specialist. For example, where certain topics might have once been considered the sole responsibility of the metaphysical philosopher, those who ponder the nature of reality, Those various avenues of thought have now been compartmentalised into the tasks that are set before the theoretical physicist, the cosmologist, the neurobiologist, and those working in AI or consciousness studies. And so what becomes clear is that science has not so much devoured philosophy, rather it has specialised it. But this is nothing new since science is itself a child of philosophy. Given that it was the formulation of logic set down by Aristotle that enabled science to attain its most robust foundations. And so this entwining has always been present. Because each school shares the same prerequisite of having to remain conversant with the boundary-pushing conversations of the day. It's just that in the 21st century, for philosophy to retain its relevance it must now ride upon an inexhaustible torrent of development and discovery. This is why, rather than flying under its own flag, modern philosophical discourse is more often found entwined within those various investigative fields, as they each seek to look past their borders. The role of the futurist is just another example where the hallmarks of philosophy are again present as they seek to interpret what greater influence the technological revolution is having on the world at large. And equally within the domains of animal rights, biotechnologies and even human augmentation, the philosophical voice of ethics is playing its part in ensuring that the seemingly unbounded march of progress is restrained by at least some portion of insight. But those who do fly under the flag of philosophy are more than aware of the dangers in such rampant compartmentalization, as when it comes to seeking the answers to those less tangible generalities, such as seeking a philosophy to live by, it's clear that the insight inevitably needed will not be that of the specialist, but that which is relevant to a much broader context. And so it is in stark contrast the role of the modern scientist and the strict niches of the specialist, that philosophy for philosophy's sake must remain distinct and regarded important as the all-rounder, the puzzle master, the questioner, or as defined by its original Pythagorean definition, simply as the lover of wisdom. Further, it is only through the combining of these focused efforts in a bias-aware philosophical manner that we can now start to appreciate the revelations of this greater holistic tapestry, a perspective brought about through a healthy dose of curiosity and a tendency to indulge in a wide variety of investigative fields. Fields such as um, astronomy, quantum physics, biology, artificial intelligence, neuroscience, the social sciences, history, and of course, philosophy itself. 
For when we step back and appreciate all of this emerging data as a unified whole, what we begin to see is a brave, complex and detailed picture, one which, like never before, hints at the truths that lay hidden behind experience. And this is where you, myself, and both the philosophers and scientists of this modern world currently find themselves. Much of what will unfold over the course of this series shall in some part be intended for and thus directed toward that loud and currently influential voice of the ever-rational material nihilist. Amid a time of social, political and mental unrest, as we have scrambled to make sense of a crisis in meaning and as individuals have sought to incorporate a 21st century rationality into their own private understandings of life, the universe and everything, this voice, above any other, has become increasingly dominant. A philosophy that might be encapsulated by the phrase, in the grand scheme of things, my life is meaningless because when I'm gone, I'm gone. Whether we choose to interpret this philosophy as a positive, negative, or indifferent creature, it is nonetheless one that has been encouraged, if not egged on, by our technology fueled culture and its scientifically driven narrative. A voice that has forced much uncomfortable doubt into the religious teachings of prior generations, whilst at the same time supported an overt confidence in the materialist descriptions of what is and what is not real. And therefore, in respect of this peculiarly unique point in our history, it is important that we address this voice directly, as it's the role of philosophy to question all such pervading norms, regardless of how rational they might appear to our sensibilities. Equally, in cultivating these concepts for the modern day nihilist, materialist and or atheist, I have granted myself a few small liberties in the assumption that those listening do already or should agree on the validity of certain significantly developed scientific theories such as evolution, relativity or quantum mechanics, in the sense that Whilst all science must understand itself to be an open-ended process, science must also be considered a trustworthy mode of thought, capable of lighting our path as we strive to move beyond it. For if we are to ever shift our species' primary focus from simply seeking knowledge towards seeking wisdom, then move beyond it we must. Though it is with this now said that I can also address the religious at heart, of whom's company I would never wish to discourage in any way. Because from within this following dissection of infinity and the infinite perspective, a consideration of God is not so easily dismissed. But regardless of each listener's own personal beliefs, the shared realization of our modern landscape is that in many of today's increasingly secular societies, where science has drawn a curtain on what was once accepted in blind faith, and where the remaining hole in our heart is being filled by possessions, careers, and the importance of social status, it has become more important than ever that we take our own time to reflect and to wonder, to become self-aware and ask ourselves the big questions. So ask yourself, what is the deepest, most profound question you can think of right now? I'll give you a sec. Take your time, we're not in any hurry. So what did you go for? One of the classics like, why are we here? Or how did all of this begin? Is there a God? Or something more scientific like, uh, what is time? Or are we alone? Are we a great simulation, hologram, or imagination? Why is there something rather than nothing? Or an ever popular favourite? Why bother? Personally, I see this as an extremely useful practice. In fact, I feel I've been asking myself these questions my entire life. 
I can still recall the evening when I first became acquainted with the concepts of both death and infinity. I was only about five years old, and though it wasn't wholly dramatic, I do remember laying awake at night, disturbed to the point of distress, as I wrestled with two fundamental questions. What is the edge of space, and what will happen when I die? I remember feeling very lost and alone, like I was shrinking, becoming smaller and smaller, as if at any moment I might just wink out like a candle. This was the universal terror, familiar to us all, awoken in that crystallised moment when we first realised that one day we will leave all that we know and all that we have come to call home to disappear and never return. So, as I lay there, contorted in my bed, literally shaking with the fear, I recall my dad's silhouette passing across my bedroom door as he came and sat beside me. When I explained why I was so upset, he very quickly gave me two simple concepts to consider. Firstly, he asked, Do you remember what it was like before you were born? No, I said. Are you afraid of that time? Having no real problem with the infinity that stretched out before my birth, I figured that if death was just to be a return to that, then perhaps there was nothing really to worry about. Dealing so swiftly with this first demon, I then acquired about the edge of space. If there is an edge, he said, like a big ice wall around us, then we have to ask ourselves, what's behind the wall? And if we continue past that wall until we find another, what's behind that wall? It was in these moments that the infinite nature of reality opened to me. Since then, I, like you, have fumbled my way into something resembling adulthood. And will now find myself bothering friends and family, chatting the night away about topics, ideas and issues, all of which stem from those same two original questions. So the more I've learnt, the more excited I've become about what it is that I truly am, and what it is that this reality might truly be. Like a never-ending bag of surprises, and such rewarding surprises they more often are too. Stories of our shared nature, stories that are free to all and willing to be revealed to anyone through even the timidest initiation into the wider collective of human thought, art and discovery. Perspective-changing revelations, many of which have only been discovered or confirmed within this last century, are now beginning to reinforce the messages that were once passed down by ancient teachers, forever drawing our attention to the existence of universal patterns, patterns that have the potential to give meaning to the meaningless, to lift the everyday anxiety of mortality and to offer us the all-important proof that we now all seem to require of our worldly explanations. Real-world evidence that can allow us to once again understand our connection with nature and the magic of reality as it exists in all of its beauty and majesty, like the gods of old, only without the contradictions, rules, or fear. Because, as it has been so often said, the more we know, the less we fear. Throughout this series, I will tiptoe and on occasion stampede through the various mind bends that have not only been integral to the development of my own understanding of reality, but which have also been responsible for the like revelations in minds of many of history's greatest thinkers. Key thought experiments that have, upon my reflection, become mental landmarks that allow for the navigation and re-navigation of an all-encompassing philosophy. Though it is important to note that for humanity this will forever be an unending process, one which neither I nor any other should ever believe that they might fully complete. For the nature of our being dictates that our understanding must always be of a finite nature, 
And if we are to postulate the idea that there might be an infinite of information out there, well then we all must allow ourselves to consider the very real possibility that there might always be an infinite of unknown. Yet this doesn't mean that our pondering, discoveries or ideas are worthless. In the words of Socrates, true wisdom comes to each of us when we realize how little we understand about life, ourselves, and the world around us. In a sense, we must own our ignorance and learn to wear it as a badge of pride. Because this honest inner realization of knowing that we know nothing is one of those mind bends that have been at the center of many great schools of thought. An idea that has at times lifted my own spirit to a state of utter euphoria. But I don't think we're quite ready for that just yet. To begin with, we must first look towards what we think we do know. And so I now wish to ask you to take a moment and simply become aware of yourself. Don't worry, we aren't jumping into anything controversial just yet. Simply become aware of your body and its senses and how they interact with your surroundings. What's the very first thing that we notice? From the moment of birth or the waking moments in the early morning, as all senses launch into action, we each individually believe that we are alive. Simple, yes? So what's the evidence for this hypothesis? Of course, we believe this because we experience it. Enter suspect number one, consciousness. I think, therefore I am. So what is this experience telling us? It would seem that we consider our consciousness to reside within a physical body, within a physical world. Upon closer inspection, we realize that this physicality is made up of many substructures, cellular structures, which are themselves made of molecular structures, built upon atomic and subatomic structures. These atomic bodies appear to be subject to a set of laws that holistically form a grander system that we like to refer to as the universe. Enter suspect number two, physics. I am a particular way, therefore I think. But what physics and the scientific method as a whole has always been attempting to achieve has not necessarily been the endless seeking of answers. More often, it's just been about seeking the right questions. And so in this spirit, before we try to answer anything, let us consider what are the best questions. Should we begin by asking why or how? Are these even different questions? A more materialist mind might choose to dismiss why as a failed question. Or if they do choose to ask why, then they will often try to answer it with a series of hows. Concerning reality, a philosopher may ask why, but a scientist must ask how. Though English is rarely black and white, the reason for this is that why tends to imply some form of inherent reason, purpose or intention though it's practically always an intention that is offered by some conscious mind. So the issue which then presents itself to the non-religious observer is that if the universe has existed for an approximate 13.8 billion years and has only very recently developed a level of awareness capable of asking the question why, how then could any answer to the question why ever be fundamental to an understanding of reality? since such an answer is in effect no more than an idea. So does this mean that our pursuit for meaning is over before it's begun? For now, let us just consider what how can tell us, as there happens to have been a great deal of effort put into answering this as a question. At this point, I think it would be fun to start stretching our visualising skills, because we are definitely going to need them. Simply imagine holding a grain of sand between your fingers and holding it up to the sky at arm's length. Behind that grain are approximately 10,000 galaxies, quadrillion stars, and just as many planetary systems. Exactly the image taken by Hubble's ultra deep field in 2004 and the James Webb telescope in 2022. But how can we even begin to comprehend this scale? if at least 
enough to be considered useful when pondering the nature of reality. Maybe let's start a little closer to home. Thank you so much for listening to the episode. Um, I just wanted to offer a massive round of thanks uh, and let you know that the conversation will be continuing both on our YouTube page and shortly on our uh, Discord page. Many know that I've been researching this project for the last couple of years and much of what will be presented over the coming series uh, has been taken from the first draft of a manuscript that I've been working on um, and I'd love to hear from you all just to learn what you liked, what you disliked, um, where you might think I'm wrong, where you might think I'm right um, and basically just continue the conversation uh, because of course discourse and community is what makes uh, philosophy something that's living. So I'm very honoured to be sharing this process and this path and this journey with you. Um, So I very much look forward to hearing from you all and continuing uh, the journey together. Finally, the YouTube page is currently up and running and that's giving weekly visualisations to the same readings that's happening in the podcast. So if you want to go over there and check that out, that is, again, Infinite Now with Sean Crowley head over there look at the artwork that's being produced for that Uh, a lot of work's gone into it so hopefully i'll see you there week by week apart from that good morrow much love and uh i hope you have a lovely day see ya